Hey there, and welcome back to another video on Englishes around the world. This time, our journey takes us to Africa, which is home to many different varieties of English and also different types of varieties. Most importantly, there are pigeons, there are indigenized L2 varieties, and there are high contact L1 varieties. In this video, I'll talk about some of the sounds of African varieties of English, and I'll also address some of their grammatical structures and their social characteristics. The plan for this video is that I'll first discuss a few general issues with regard to varieties of English that are spoken in Africa. What do they have in common? How do they differ? And how does English in Africa fit into the more general picture of what I've been talking about in earlier videos? It's, for example, obvious that we cannot really understand the role of English in Africa without taking into account the colonial history of African varieties of English. In the main part of this video, I want to take a closer look at two different varieties of English, namely Black South African English and Cameroon Pidgin English. Okay, why these two? Um, as I'll explain in more detail, Black South African English is what we call an indigenized L2 variety that has developed in the context of a settlement colony, South Africa. By contrast, uh, Cameroon Pidgin English is a West African variety that is the product of an exploitation colony and that instantiates the kind of language variety that is called a pidgin. So we'll see how these varieties are similar and how they are different. Some of the information that I present in this video, including some of the sounds that you'll hear, comes from Edgar Schneider's excellent book, English Around the World. Especially chapters five and six contain sections on African Englishes. And if you want to read up on any of the issues that I discuss in this video, I really recommend that you take a look at those sections. Okay, with all that in mind, let's go ahead and get started. And let's take this question here first. What characterizes varieties of English that are spoken in Africa? Aside, of course, their geographical distribution. And for that, it's useful to take a step back and look at the global picture. African Englishes are part of the so-called third diaspora of English. If you remember the earlier videos in the series, uh, the first diaspora is the move of English from England to Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. In the second diaspora, English crosses the ocean to North America and to Australia and to New Zealand. And the third diaspora, what we're looking at today, uh, concerns the parts of the world that you see circled on this slide here. Yeah, we have the Caribbean, we have West Africa, East Africa, we have South Africa, India, and Southeast Asia. And you have no difficulty recognizing this. This all reflects uh, British colonialism. And if you've watched the video on colonialism earlier in the series, you'll remember what I said about different types of colonies. There are four of them that are useful to distinguish uh, when we talk about languages. So there are trade colonies, which represent the start of the colonial enterprise. And initially, trade colonies are established without a permanent co-presence of the trading parties. They only see each other every once in a while. And this means that the traders don't have a common language. They don't have the time to develop a common means of communication, but they still need to communicate, of course. And this results linguistically in a limited purpose lingua franca, a pigeon. Okay, trade colonies eventually turn into exploitation colonies, which, as the name suggests, are exploited by the metropolis for economic benefit. Yeah? So the colonizers exploit the countries that they are colonizing. Uh, in the case of West Africa, the major economic factor has been, of course, the slave trade. I talked about that in the colonialism video. So here we're not just seeing the exploitation of natural resources, but even the exploitation and systematic abduction of human beings. Now, um, coming to settlement colonies, I've talked a lot about settlement colonies in earlier videos in this series, specifically in the videos about English in America and English down under. Go check them out if you haven't seen them already. And uh, settlement colonies also play a role in Africa, 
We have them in South Africa and in East Africa. I'll say more on that in just a minute. Now, coming to the fourth type, plantation colonies play a crucial role in the development of Creole languages. So the Caribbean is very important in this context. I won't say a lot about plantation colonies in this video, but if you're interested, you know, go back and watch the video on colonialism and also the one on pigeons and creoles, both in this series to find out more about that. All right, let's go back to the third diaspora. When you look at this map, the third diaspora of English represents exploitation colonies such as India, but also the plantation colonies of the Caribbean and then settlement colonies such as South Africa, and then the trade colonies in West Africa that gradually uh, transformed into exploitation colonies. So really all four uh, colony types are represented in the third diaspora. With regard to linguistic aspects, uh, this means that there is a lot of variety. Yeah? In the third diaspora, English enters new environments, it enters new cultural and linguistic contexts, and it comes into direct and pretty intense contact with other languages. In the colonies of the third diaspora, the use of English takes place in multilingual situations with languages that are not genetically related, yeah? so they're not all in the European, um, and they have very different structural features. Yeah? So the structures of West African languages are very different from the structures that you find in Southeast Asia and in India. Yeah? So the results, the outcomes of these contact scenarios are very different. Um, the varieties that we will focus on in this video are furthermore learner varieties. That is, they're used by speakers who have a different L1 and who use English as a medium for communication in some situations of their daily lives. This is different from the scenarios in settlement colonies that I discussed in the videos on English in America and English down under. Now, um, in the areas of the third diaspora, we actually find quite a lot of English varieties that are so-called indigenized L2 varieties. And I'd like to say a few things about those first. So on this slide here, you see a screenshot of the E-Wave Atlas, the Electronic World Atlas of Varieties of English. And I've selected only those varieties that are of this specific type, yeah, the green circles. And you see that there are quite a few of these in Africa. And we're going to look at one of them in particular, namely Black South African English which is an indigenized L2 variety of English that is spoken by L1 speakers of Bantu languages and of Khoisan languages. The variety is, of course, of quite recent origin, uh, since during the apartheid regime in South Africa, access to English was severely limited, so that, for example, school education in English was not accessible to black South African children. This gradually changed in the 1970s, and from the 1990s onward, the choice of schools became more open, with the result that Black South African English was spoken in a wider variety of contexts, so also in schools that used to be reserved for white children only. Uh, we'll listen to an example of Black South African English in just a minute. Now, before that, I just want to clarify that Africa is not just home to indigenized L2 varieties, but also to other types of Englishes. So as you can see on this map here, uh, which is again from the E-Wave, um, now just as a reminder, the, the green circles are the indigenized L2 varieties, the ones we looked at just a minute ago. The red diamonds are high contact L1 varieties, Blue upside down triangles are pigeons, and then brown triangles are creoles. In Africa, the E Wave documents three high contact L1 Englishes, namely Liberian Settler English, White Zimbabwean English, and White South African English. Uh, these varieties are Englishes that are spoken by the descendants of the English speaking colonizers who settled down in these respective areas. Liberian Settler English is actually based on American English, and by contrast, White Zimbabwean English and White South African English 
are based on British English. Now, then we have a number of English-based pigeons, all of which are found in West Africa. And I mentioned in earlier videos that one way for pigeons to emerge is in trade colonies. And this is, for example, how Nigerian pigeon and Cameroon pigeon came about. Now, I need to say a few words about how English was initially brought to Africa. Uh, colonialism in Africa began in the 17th century with trading posts along the West African coast. Uh, the British established a settlement colony in Sierra Leone in 1787, and an, an American settlement was established in Liberia in 1822. So that's how uh, Liberian settler English came about. Um, up to that point, however, Africa was not really a central target for European colonialism. Yeah? So this changed towards the end of the 19th century. And uh, the picture that you see on this slide here is a rendition of an event that is called the Berlin Conference of 1884. If you're into German history, you will recognize the guy with the impressive moustache. Uh, it's Movember, after all. Yeah. So the guy with the moustache is first Otto von Bismarck, who had called the meeting. And uh, as you can easily see in the background, uh, the topic of the meeting was Africa and its colonization. And uh, the, the, the guy in front of the map is probably saying something like, OK, I'll take Cameroon if that's all right for you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. This is clearly a matter that is not funny at all. But at the same time, the picture and the entire history, in fact, is so absurd and ridiculous that I have a hard time talking about it with a straight face. Sorry. So let's leave the picture aside and let's concentrate on the historical events. The Berlin Conference of 1884 led to an agreement between 14 states, uh, including Germany, the UK, Belgium, France and others, uh, to organize the colonialist exploitation of Africa, which is also known as the so-called scramble for Africa. You'll read that term in Schneider's book, but also elsewhere. So about 20 years after the Berlin Conference, the continent was almost entirely under European colonial rule, as you can see in the map on this slide here. So you see, for example, that the British have taken control of South Africa and Zimbabwe, Nigeria, and then large parts of East Africa, uh, including today's Egypt, uh, Sudan, and Kenya. So this, uh, incidentally, represents the British Empire at its greatest extent. So as you can see on this slide here, um, British colonialism affected the entire planet, really, in the 1920s. It was, however, on its way out. So uh, World War II can be seen as a turning point in the history of European colonialism because it caused a loosening of the ties between Britain and its colonies. And the financial resources that Britain had to put into the war uh, was no longer available to fund colonial expansion. Um, in addition, anti-colonial movements were on the rise worldwide. And the map of Africa that you see here shows the years in which African countries became independent. Uh, this is known as the wind of change in Africa. So from the scramble for Africa to the wind of change, that gives you the two brackets of colonialism in Africa. All of this just as a quick background for our discussion of African Englishes. What characterizes them? How are they similar? How are they different? As I said earlier, we'll have a closer look at two varieties, starting with South African Black English. As always, let's get started with an actual soundbite of the variety. And uh, here I brought along a text from Edgar Schneider's book, um, which in turn is based on fieldwork by Lucia Siebert. So uh, she has published a book on morphosyntax in Black South African English, and she also includes uh, sociolinguistic considerations into her analysis. So if you have a chance to check it out, I highly recommend it. Um, so here's a recording of a story about lions. Let's listen to it once, uh, just so you get used to the sound of it. 
and then we'll listen to individual parts of it that illustrate characteristic features of South African Black English. So um, here we go. Let me press play. Uh, the animals that are the old good and illness and everything, they're not used to lions. You see, so it's easy for the lions to catch an animal and eat. Yeah, but they say sometimes they can stay three days without catching. They don't always catch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes they, they do attack what the, the animals run. And then most of the time those lions, they fool. You see, they're not hungry. Yeah, because uh, there's like a couple of stories, another guy was coming to Grahamstown and then he had to go hitchhike, but it is like something like a, as less than a kilometer. You have to walk, but within the game reserve to the tar road, you see, and he was walking there unexpectedly, and then... Okay, I think you have an impression. Um, now, in the next minutes, I want to go over several sound features that you maybe heard, but they can be difficult to pin down exactly. So let's take this bit by bit, starting with one phenomenon that is common to many African varieties of English, and actually also pigeons and creoles. And here I'm talking about the avoidance of central vowels, that is, vowels that are neither front vowels nor back vowels, but in the middle of the vowel space. Uh, this avoidance of central vowels manifests itself differently in South African Black English. For example, in the backing of the schwa vowel, yeah, the central unstressed vowel that you and I pronounce as an uh, for example, in the word lion. Yeah? So the second one there, uh, lion, uh, yeah? so that's what it is. Let's listen to how our speaker pronounces the word lions, which uh, you heard earlier in the transcript. I'm going to press play here. They're not used to lions. Okay, so the speaker says they're not used to lions. Let's listen to this again. They're not used to lions. Mm -hmm. So I think you can hear that the schwa is realized not as a central unstressed vowel, but rather as the lot vowel, yeah, lions. So instead of being in the middle, schwa is backed in that word. It's pronounced further back in the mouth. Um, does that mean that schwa is always realized as a lot vowel in South African Black English? Uh, well, no, yeah. So how schwa is realized really depends on the words. It can be backed but it can also be lowered in words such as animal or uh, kilometer. Yeah, let me play this for you. Uh, when I say animal, yeah, <clears throat> uh, the, the uh, I vowel yeah, is, is mostly just a schwa, animal. And in kilometer, um, well, the, the, the last vowel there uh, really blends with the R in uh, my pronunciation, but not in the way our speaker pronounces it. So I'm going to press play on animal. An animal. An animal. Gonna play it again. An animal. So it sounds more like animal, yeah? So the A at the end uh, has more substance uh, than just uh, an unstressed schwa. And uh, here's kilometer. That's less than a kilometer. And again, we're looking at the last vowel here and it sounds more like kilometer, yeah? Not kilometer, well, <clears throat> kilometer. Let's listen to it. That's less than a kilometer. Okay, so um, <clears throat> in these words, uh, the schwa is realized as the strut vowel. So it's lower than your usual mid-central schwa. We also find instances where schwa is raised, for example, in words such as t, yeah? So here the speaker says, they're not used to lions. And when I say that casually, the vowel in t is really a schwa, yeah? They're not used to lions, um, used t. Uh, but the speaker pronounces it differently. Let's listen. They're not used to lions. Going to play it again. They're not used to lions. Yeah, I think you can hear that 
Here, um, the schwa is really more realized as the foot vowel. It's pronounced further back and further up, giving us a high back vowel, essentially. Right, so, so all of this illustrates the avoidance of central vowels. Schwa tends to be realized not as a weak central vowel, but instead as a strut vowel, a lot vowel, or a foot vowel. Okay, so uh, that's one interesting feature, but there is more. Um, South African Black English further shows two mergers in the level of the high vowels. Um, long and short high vowels are collapsed so that there is no distinction, for example, between full and fool in the back. Yeah? And there's also a merger in the front. So in a word such as animal, I have a very short realization of I that is really close to a schwa, but the speaker pronounces this differently with a longer pronunciation. So listen out for the I uh, in an animal. Um, we'll listen to that first. An animal. An animal. An animal. Yeah, I hope you can hear that. That's the, the, the I is uh, well a lot more pronounced than I would uh, do that. And uh, here we have the word full. The lions, they full, you see. And uh, it sounds a little bit more like fool uh, than my re realization of the word full. Most of the time those lions, they fool. You see, they're not hungry. Most of the time those lions, they fool. You see, they're not hungry. Okay. Good. So essentially what is happening is that the short long distinction of high vowels that exists in standard British English or standard American English is not maintained in South African Black English. Yeah, this distinction is lost. The shorter variants are lengthened. So the kit vowel sounds more like the fleece vowel and the foot vowel sounds more like the goose vowel. Right. There's one more feature that I'd like to mention, namely the monophthongization of the goat vowel in words such as go. When I say go, it starts with a schwa and then moves up. Yeah, so it's go. And I've already mentioned that schwa tends to be avoided in South African Black English. So that means it's not that much of a surprise to see that the goat vowel is realized as a simple monophthong in South African Black English. Let's listen to the way the speaker pronounces the word go. And then he had to go hitchhike. Yeah, he had to go hitchhike. And then he had to go hitchhike. Yeah. Okay, so it's uh, <clears throat> it's uh, go, not go. And um, there's actually some symmetry to this. Uh, we find the same kind of uh, phenomenon in the back with the goat vowel and then in the front with the face vowel. So when I say face, it's clearly a diphthong, yeah? But South African Black English has a monophthong in that place, face, yeah? So it's go, not go, and it's face, not face. Uh, let me play this. So uh, the speaker pronounces the word say. Yeah, but they say sometimes again. Yeah, but they say sometimes again. Yeah, so uh, they say, those are actually both face vowels, uh, are realized as they say. Yeah, I hope you can hear that. Now, <clears throat> um, so that means uh, we have the monophthongization of say, uh, and the mid front and mid back vowels are both real monophthongs. Okay. That completes our little overview of sound features in South African Black English. There are more that I uh, could mention, but this already gives you a first impression. So let's leave it at that for the moment and let's look at some grammatical features. In the Lion story, we actually have a couple of features that are characteristic of learner varieties of English, such as, for example, the omission of plural marking, uh, that you see in a couple of story. Yeah, it's not a couple of stories, it's a couple of story. That's what the speaker says. Uh, then we have the omission of verb agreement inflections, as in he look instead of he looked. Um, there are so-called resumptive pronouns 
uh, like for example those lions they full yeah instead of those lions are full with a copula a form of the verb to be uh, instead of that we have another pronoun in there that is resumptive because the noun phrase has already been expressed uh, a bit later in the story there is an example that you didn't hear but that is easy enough to understand namely intensification by reduplication so if something is really really intense you express that by repeating the word in question i just did this with really actually if you paid attention so um the example from the story is uh this guy was like walking 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 and that means of course that there was quite a bit of walking involved in the situation right um, if you want to take a deep dive into the morphosyntactic features of South African Black English, the place you should go is the eWave. It's online, it's free. There's a link in the description below. Uh, and the information in this section of the eWave has been provided by Raj Mestri. So this is really as close to the actual thing as you can get. I highly recommend you go and check it out. Okay. We're coming to the last part of this video and here I'd like to say a few words about Cameroon Pidgin English and I'll use that opportunity to show you yet another fantastic resource, namely the APEX, the Atlas of Pidgin and Creole Language Structures Online. The interface is very similar to the eWave and like the eWave it is free to use and in fact the whole concept of this resource is very close to the eWave except that here we're dealing with an even broader database of languages. The APEX contains uh, 76 Pidgin and Creole languages from around the world. Uh, it was put together by Susanne Michaelis, Philipp Maurer, Martin Haspelmatt and Magnus Huber uh, with support from the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology and the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. So thanks to the funders. Um, most importantly, it's really fun to use and it's just an amazing resource all around. Uh, there is a link in the description below. Yeah, if you want to follow along on your screen, you can do that immediately. Otherwise, just keep watching or do it later. Um, I really recommend it. I'm going to move on now and show you a few things that you can do with the E-Wave. No, not the E-Wave, the Apex, of course. So. First of all, the uh, interface lets you select languages that are based on the same lexifier language. You remember from the video on pigeons and creoles that um, pigeons are mixtures of a lexifier language that provides many of the words and then one or more substrate languages that provide much of the grammatical structures. So here we're selecting all the pigeons and creoles that are English based. Um, that still leaves a good number of them. Some of them we have in the e-wave, others we don't. Uh, but even for those that we have in the e-wave, the Apex gives you certain things that are not there in the e-wave. Yeah? So uh, here the blue dots are all the English-based pigeons and creoles. And then of course you can click on any of those dots. Uh, I selected here Cameroon Pigeon English. And when I click on the title, uh, so the Cameroon Pidgin English that is marked up in blue, uh, I get to a page that has lots of information and importantly for us, a gloss text with an audio recording. Yeah? This is something that the e-wave doesn't have, actual sound recordings with transcriptions. So that is really cool. Uh, let's take a look at the text that represents Cameroon Pidgin English. Here we have the first lines of it. <clears throat> the actual example is much longer. Uh, so this is from the Bible, Matthew 19, if you need to know. Yeah? Uh, it's about Jesus and the children. You might even know it, you know, let the children come to me. Uh, let's listen to this first, yeah? and then we'll go through it bit by bit so that you understand what's going on linguistically. Okay, I'm going to play this once now. Jesus, he bless more picking them. Some day people then be the bring picking them for Jesus say make he touch them. But Jesus he learn about them begin hala, begin hala the people. Okay, 
So I think we need to listen to this again. The South African Black English, that I think you could understand straight away. But this, well, when you listen for it for, to it for the first time, it actually sounds like a different language altogether with some words that sound vaguely like English. Let's listen to it again. Jesus, he blessed more picking them. Someday people then be the bring picking them for Jesus, say, make you touch them. But Jesus, he learn about them, begin hala. Begin hala the, peop the people. Okay. Let's go through this bit by bit so that we understand what's going on. So the first sentence, of course, starts with Jesus. Yeah. Uh, after Jesus, we have a marker that identifies uh, Jesus as a subject in the third person singular. So Jesus, he, if you like, bless. That is the word bless that you know from English. Small, again, that's easy enough to, uh, to identify as the adjective small. Pickin, that means child. And dem is a plural marker. So uh, children, of course, is a plural form. And many pigeons work in such a way that the nouns only have the singular form. And then there is a separate word that indicates that we're talking about several ones. This is what's going on here. Jesus, he blessed small child many. Yeah, This is what the structures literally say. Going on to the uh, next line here. Someday, well, that again is easy enough to uh, see. Uh, someday people, <clears throat> so one day people, again, them, well, them really, uh, the plural marker. So people can be just one person, yeah? But when you have people, them, it's many, yeah? Some, some people, been, that is a past marker. So we're talking about something that happened a while ago, uh, D, <clears throat> uh, that is a so-called imperfective marker. That's an aspectual distinction. I don't want you to worry too much about it here. Um, so um, English doesn't have a lot of aspectual distinctions, what linguists call grammatical aspect. But here in Cameroon Pidgin English, we have an imperfective marker that says something about how the situation in the past is viewed. Bring again is no problem. Yeah. Um, so one day people uh, brought, <clears throat> so we have the verb in the basic form and the past marker tells us that, okay, this happened a while ago. Again, in the English that you and I are using, brought has an irregular past tense form. Uh, this is not there in Cameroon Pidgin English. Uh, Picken, we already saw that, that means child, dem, yeah, picking them many children. For this is a variant of the preposition for. Okay, let's move on to the third line here. Uh, Jesus say make e touch them. Um, <clears throat> so Jesus, of course, that again means Jesus say. There you recognize a form of the verb say. But the tricky thing is it doesn't mean say. It is a grammatical marker here that introduces what linguists call a complement clause. So it could be translated with so that. Yeah. Mm. So if we take the uh, second line, <clears throat> it means uh, someday the people, they brought children for Jesus so that make eat touch them. Uh, so they could make him touch them. Yeah, this is the construction. Someday they brought children to Jesus so that he uh, should touch them. That's the idea. Um, then we go on, uh, but Jesus, again, that's easy enough to understand, but uh, Jesus ye lan boy dem begin hala di people. Okay, what does that mean? Um, but Jesus is clear. Ye, that is a possessive marker. So something belongs to a third person singular, namely Jesus. So Jesus says, learn boy. I'll let you figure out what a learn boy is. Yeah. So who can Jesus learn boys be? Well, the disciples, of course. Yeah. So this is a very uh, cool way for this pigeon to describe 
what a disciple is. A disciple, that of course is very technical terminology. Well, basically, disciples are boys that learn from a master. So the disciples are learned boys. Again, we have the plural marker. Yeah. So Jesus's learn boys begin. They started hala. That means scold the people. So, but Jesus's disciples began to scold the people, namely that they shouldn't bring the children to Jesus. Okay. So what I would like you to appreciate is how different this is from the English that you and I are using. Okay. It really looks like a different language. And so this is very different from the example of South African black English that we saw earlier. It's a lot more removed from standard British English or standard American English. Okay, so that's the kind of data that you can get from the Apex, but there is more. If you scroll down just a little on the page for Cameroon Pigeon English, you first get to the so-called primary features. They roughly correspond to the morphosyntactic features that you've seen in the E-Wave, except that they capture different grammatical phenomena. Yeah. So for example, the order of subject, object, and verb that can differ across different pigeons and creoles. And so it's included as a feature here. Um, there's also color coding that you see. So there's red and blue and yellow, and that means something different than what we saw earlier in the E-Wave where color indicates the prevalence of a feature. So here the colors mean something different. And you also see that some of the circles are sort of half filled or one third filled. And also that is meaningful. For example, you see that the second and third line are really about the same feature. Uh, what it says here is order of possessor and possessum. What this means is that this is about possessive constructions, things like John's car or the center of the building. And uh, the two lines are about different orders of the person who possesses something and the thing that is being possessed. So the first line here says possess and possessor. So that means the thing that is possessed comes first and the possessor comes after. And in the third line, it's really just the other way around. Yeah. So what the color tells you is that in Cameroon Pigeon English, uh, the first variant, possessum possessor, is less common than the other way around. So usually we have the possessor first and uh, then we have the possessum. And incidentally, well, in the example that we saw, uh, Jesus ye learn boy, that's exactly it. Yeah? So that is possessor and then the possessive marker and then the thing that is possessed, the learn boys. Well, Jesus doesn't really own the disciples, but it's that kind of construction. Okay, now, if you click on the little writer that says IPA chart, you get, well, big surprise, an IPA chart with all the consonants and of course, with all the vowels. And what you see here, for example, is that Cameroon Pigeon English, like South African Black English avoids central vowels. We have uh, an E, an U, an E, an O, an uh, E, and an O, and an A. But in the middle, there is nothing much going on. Um, and the uh, apex actually accounts for sounds that exist marginally. Yeah. So here, uh, the bold lines means that uh, the sound exists as a major allophone. Um, if it's a little lined, then the sound exists only as a minor allophone. And in dots, uh, there a sound exists only in loan words. So not even in loan words do we have central vowels in Cameroon Pigeon English. Now, finally, there is also a tab with sociolinguistic information, like the proportion of native speakers, whether the use is increasing or decreasing and so on and so forth. There really is a lot to explore 
And uh, if all of that is not enough for you, the APEX very conveniently points you to the published studies that address all of these features. So you can look up the references uh, that you have on the right hand side here. You can find them in your library or somewhere on the internet and you can get to the source of the information that is represented in the APEX. Okay, that's all I wanted to cover for this video. I hope you have a good first impression of Englishes in Africa. There's obviously a lot that I did not talk about. So please let me know in the comments if there's something that I really should go back to and address in another video. That's all for today. I hope you'll join me for another episode very soon in which our journey will finally take us to Southeast Asia. I know that some people are waiting and I won't let you down. Until then, I wish you all the best. See you soon. Bye bye.